सो हेलो एवरीबडी वेलकम टू नीट क्रैश कोर्स बायोलॉजी सो लेट इस नाउ डिस्कस द सिनॉपसिस ऑफ टू चैप्टर्स द फर्स्ट चैप्टर दैट आई विल बी डिस्कसिंग विद यू इज लोको मोशन एंड मूवमेंट सो वॉट इज लोको मोशन लोको मोशन इज द एबिलिटी ऑफ एन ऑर्गेनिज्म टू मूव इट इज़ वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट एंड फंडामेंटल कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स ऑफ लिविंग ऑर्गेनिजम्स यू हैव टू एग्जिबिट लोको मोशन इवन फॉर एग्जाम्पल यू एग्जिबिट मूवमेंट्स लाइक फॉर एग्जाम्पल इंजेशन ऑफ फूड एंड स्वालोइंग ऑफ फूड सो वॉट इज़ द डिफरेंस बिटवीन सिंपल मूवमेंट सच एज दीज एंड वॉट इज़ लोको मोशन सो एक्चुअली अ मूवमेंट इज डिफरेंट फ्राम लोको मोशन बिकॉज वेन अ मूवमेंट ब्रिंग्स अबाउट अ चेंज इन योर लोकेशन ओनली देन वी कॉल इट एज अ लोको मोशन ओके सो वॉट इज मैंशन हियर दैट इज इंजेशन ऑफ फूड एंड स्वालोइंग ऑफ फूड एट्सेट्रा दे आर नॉट लोको मोशन बट दे आर मूवमेंट्स एंड वेन मूवमेंट इज चेंजिंग योर लोकेशन देन इट इज रेफर टू एज लोको मोशन वॉट आर द टाइप्स ऑफ मूवमेंट्स इन द एनिमल बॉडी लाइक फॉर एग्जाम्पल वी हैव सेल्स लाइक डब्ल्यू बी सीज विच डोंट हैव अ डेफिनेट शेप विच मूव अराउंड इन योर टिश्यूज दे कम आउट ऑफ योर ब्लड वेसल्स दे मूव इन टू योर सराउंडिंग टिश्यूज विद द हेल्प ऑफ दी सीडोपोडिया दिस इज सीन इन द केस ऑफ डब्ल्यू बी सीज दिस टाइप ऑफ अ मूवमेंट दैट वी सी इन द ह्यूमन बॉडी इज कॉल्ड द अमीबॉइड और द सीडोपोडियल मूवमेंट then we have lot of cells in our body like for example the cells which are lining our trachea that is and our bronchial tubes as well as in the female reproductive parts such as the cells of the fallopian tube they bear these fine hair like projections on them which are referred to as cilia and what is the job of these cilia the job of these cilia is transporting substances or it would be to remove the dust particles which have entered into your airways so ciliary movement is one type of movement the second type of movement that we see very commonly in the human body okay then in this chapter we are going to mostly focus upon the third type of movement that is the muscular movement for example the movement of your jaw muscles the movement of your tongue which has lot of muscles and the movement of your limbs how do you move your limbs your hands and legs because you have muscles which are attached to your bone and that type of movement is referred to as muscular movement then the last one is called the flagellar movement flagellar movement is also seen in the case of human sperm because you know that the sperm has a tail the tail is provided by a flagellum or a central axial filament which helps in propulsion of the sperm so therefore if there is flagella involved then we we call this type of movement as the flagellar movement then continuing with that we will only focus upon the most important type of movement in this particular chapter that is muscular movement and you know that the muscles are modified for different to perform different types of movement in the part in the in case of the human body and by now you have clearly understood the difference between movement and locomotion any type of movement that brings about a change in your location is referred to as locomotion so you know about the three different types of muscles in the human body that is you have the skeletal muscles notice how the skeletal muscles are cylindrical in shape correct and they all have peripherally located nucleus the nucleus is towards the periphery of the cell and one thing that you can notice in a skeletal muscle is it has regular dark and light striations on its cell isn't it that's why we call the skeletal muscle also as the striated muscle so did you notice these striations that are present the dark and light striations which is something which is unique to that of the skeletal muscle tissue notice that the skeletal muscle are also referred to as that's why skeletal muscles are also referred to as the striated muscles and they are unbranched they are cylindrical they have peripherally located nucleus each muscle cell all of you please remember in case of muscles we don't use the word cell but we refer to it as a muscle fiber why do we call it as a muscle fiber because the cell looks like a fiber it looks like a cylinder thread like structure that's why we refer to as the muscle cells as muscle fiber how is a cardiac muscle different from a skeletal muscle now a cardiac muscle also has striations as you can see there are di- dark and light striations in the cell but did you notice that they have single nucleus present in the center now mostly they are uninucleated and how do you know what is the boundary between one cell to another now here the cells are packed like cylinders so you know which is what which is the cell where the cell ends and where the next cell ends but that is difficult to identify in a cardiac muscle cells but notice how between the cells you can find these disc like structures and these disc like structures have been labeled here as intercalated discs these are 
junctions between the adjacent or the neighboring cardiac muscle cells and the intercalated discs are also involved in communication they help the cardiac muscles to communicate with each other and why should they communicate with each other because once a cardiac muscle cell gets excited the excitation has to pass to all the cells otherwise all the cells in a bundle will not contract rhythmically they have to contract synchronously and rhythmically so that your heart can beat in a normal fashion isn't it then see how different smooth muscle cell is the smooth muscles are spindle shaped they are broad at the center and they are narrow and tapering at their ends here also can you see that they have a single nucleus it's only the skeletal muscles which are multinucleated but here you can see the smooth muscles have a single nucleus that is located at the center and can you see that their cytoplasm appears to be very very smooth and that's why they're referred to as the smooth or the unstriped or the unstriated muscle now they do not have these dark and light striations in their cell cytoplasm as a result they appear smooth in uh, they appear to be smooth in their cytoplasm and hence they are referred to as the smooth muscle tissue okay so only the uh, skeletal muscles are those which are multinucleate and it is important to note that the nuclei are present towards the periphery we shall focus exclusively on skeletal muscles in this chapter now see how the skeletal muscle now each cylinder you see here each cylinder is a skeletal muscle fiber all the skeletal muscles are bundled up into what is referred to as a fascicle so this bundle of skeletal muscle fiber is referred to as a fascicle okay it is labeled on this side this bundle is referred to as a fascicle see there are how many fascicles here there's one there's two there's three there's four there's five all the fascicles are wrapped together by connective tissue coat on the outside and this connective tissue covering on the outside of the entire muscle is referred to as the fascia or it is also called as the epimysium between the bundles also there is connective tissue between the bundle the connective tissue is referred to as the perimysium okay the outermost connective tissue covering is called the fascia or the perimysium adjacent to the bundles you can see the connective tissue that is called perimysium can you see between the muscle cells also there is a thin layer of connective tissue there is a coat of connective tissue you can see i'm shading the connective tissue coat so between the adjacent muscle cells i'm coloring it for you so there is a connective tissue between the cells and this connective tissue is referred to as the endomysium so remember your skeletal muscle first of all why is it called a skeletal muscle it is called a skeletal muscle because it is attached to your bone that is your skeleton isn't it through can you name the connective tissue that connects a muscle to a bone it is called tendon yes very good so you have these skeletal muscles and all of you remember the entire skeletal muscle is made up of bundles what are these bundles referred to as these bundles are referred to as the fascicle basically they are bundles of muscle cells see these cylindrical structures that you can see over here these cylindrical structures are nothing but a muscle cell we should not call it as a muscle cell as it is mentioned here it is called a muscle fiber now the connective tissue in between the muscle fibers is endomysium in between the bundles is perimysium outermost connective tissue layer is referred to as the fascia or the epimysium okay now if you were to look at a skeletal muscle now let me show you i told you that the skeletal muscle is cylindrical the cell or the fiber is cylindrical so i have taken one fiber remember that there are many fibers bundled up into each other you just now saw that we have a bundle of skeletal muscle fibers and what did we call one such bundle we called one such bundle as a fascicle isn't it now in that bundle i have taken one single cell one single skeletal muscle cell i have taken here and we are going to study what is there in the skeletal muscle cell the first thing you should notice in the skeletal muscle cell is this outermost membrane the outermost membrane is referred to as the sarcolemma like any cell the skeletal muscle fiber also has a plasma membrane and this plasma membrane is referred to as the sarcolemma okay and then inside you have the cytoplasm what is the cytoplasm of a muscle cell referred to as the cytoplasm of the muscle cell is referred to as the sarcoplasm 
so let us label the cytoplasm as the sarcoplasm then one important thing is they have peripherally located nucleus so let me show many many nuclei at the periphery i am talking about one single skeletal muscle fiber okay so let me label it before you're confused we will call this as a skeletal muscle fiber or a skeletal muscle cell can you see the nuclei which are sitting in the periphery now let me shade the nuclei so it is multi nucleate structure with many many nuclei which are located towards the periphery of the cell all right okay then what is the cytoplasm called the cytoplasm is called the sarcoplasm what is the membrane called the membrane is referred to as the sarcolemma now very very important thing is inside the membrane inside the cytoplasm you will see hundreds of these very very small tube like structures which are arranged parallel to one another within the skeletal muscle cell within the skeletal remember we should call it as a fiber so within the skeletal muscle fiber you will find these very very tiny cylinders which are basically present inside now these tiny cylinders are referred to as the myofibrils so what are they referred to as myofibril now let me magnify one myofibril for you out of all the cylinders let me take one particular cylinder here so this is a tiny cylinder that i've taken out a cylinder is nothing but here it is made up of proteins okay what are these tiny cylinders which are sitting inside the cytoplasm of the muscle fiber called they are called myofibrils now i have taken one single myofibril over here now notice on the myofibril at regular intervals you will find these cross striations this dark striation which is bisecting it at regular intervals okay and then you will find dark areas in the center see you will find such striations now can you see that there is a banding pattern on them now what are these dark these uh, lines which bisect them are called at regular intervals these are called the z lines so this is a z line this is a z line again the next z line again the next z line so many many z lines are there and between the two z lines can you see there is a dark zone so now let us name the dark and the light zone now this zone is the dark now can you see that a uh, part of this portion and the next here there's no darkness over here so this will be referred to as the light zone so let us call dark as d and light as l so again you have dark then you have light which is interrupted by the z line then you have dark then you have light so there are alternate dark light dark light striations which you can see that is what is the striation that you can actually see on the muscle from the outside actually the striations are not on the membrane of the muscle they are on these fine tubes which are sitting inside the cytoplasm of the muscle cell what are these fine tubes which are sitting on the inside of the muscle cell called these are referred to as the myofibril like i have shown here this is one myofibril which is magnified for you on the myofibril at regular intervals you have the z line or the z line and then all of you remember the area between one z line and the next z line let me take this z line here and then this z line here this area between one z line and the next z line or this segment of the myofibril between the two adjacent z line is referred to as the sarcomere so please bear in mind the segment between the two z lines is referred to as the sarcomia okay so sarcomia starts with one z line and it ends on the next z line and between the z lines throughout you have dark zones which i have shown in the form of these striations over here and then there are, i have not shown anything blank here that is the light zone so dark again blank light zone dark again blank light zone notice that the light zone is bisected by it is interrupted by the z line at regular interval and like i said the area between the two z line is referred to as the sarcomere okay so how does a sarcomere exactly look like so let us see what is the hierarchy that we saw first i showed you this is a muscle cell a muscle fiber then i told you inside the muscle fiber there are many many parallelly arranged cylindrical structures what did we call them we called them as myofibril then i magnified the myofibril for you on the myofibril we saw that at regular intervals there are z lines isn't it there is one z line another z line there's another z line there's another z line so all these are the z lines and then i told you the area between the two z line is called a sarcomere and where is the dark zone now wherever i'm showing striation that is the dark zone wherever you see blank 
the area clear areas are the light zone now let us see what is there between the two z lines let us magnify so this is one z line and this is the neighboring z line now in the z line you have uh, this is the z line it is referred to as the cross membrane okay it's also called as the cross membrane this is what gives the dark appearance so let me take another z line also for your understanding so i've taken three z lines here okay now from the z lines you have uh, structures which are projecting to the center very thin protein filaments are projecting to the center of the sarcomere see from the z lines you can see these structures projecting so from here also they project to the center of this sarcomere now tell me how many sarcomeres have i considered now please remember this is one z line this is the second z line this is the third z line so i have taken how many sarcomeres i have taken two sarcomeres from here to here is one sarcomere from here to here is one sarcomere from here from this z line to the next z line is the next sarcomere these filaments these protein filaments which are very very thin and which extend from the z line towards the center these are referred to as the actin myofilaments they are called myofilaments the tubes were called myofibrils now these are referred to as the myofilaments so actin myofilaments they made up of a protein referred to as actin and then now in the center you can see very thick myofilaments which are very very thick see they are the center they are present in the center of the sarcomere now these thick myofilaments are referred to as the myosin let me shade them so that you can you can see that they are very very thick so these thick myofilaments are referred to as the myosin they are made up of a protein that is referred to as myosin all right so let us label this as the myosin filaments so i'm going to label it this side so this is the myosin myofilament or simply the myosin filaments now aren't the myofin myosin filaments very thick so we can call them as thick filaments and the actin filaments thin so we can call them as the thin filaments now tell me which is the filament attached to the z line the z line is the one here in the center the zigzag line that you can see is the z line it is obviously the actin filament that is attached to the z line it is not the myosin filament that is attached to the z line in this case it is only the actin filament now why is there a dark and light striation see here now all of you can observe the central zone let me show it here for you this entire central zone of the sarcomere why does this appear dark in color we can call this entire zone as the dark band or the anisotropic band we can call it as the dark or the an isotropic band why does it appear dark because you can see both actin see actin is projecting from the center here actin is also there and you also find myosin because both actin and myosin are found the central area appears dark now can you tell me why this region appears light see this region of one sarcomere and the next sarcomere of course z line is present in between we call this as the light band or we call it as the isotropic band now why does it appear light because what is missing over here myosin is missing but it is interrupted by what but it is interrupted by the z line so that's why we see alternate dark light again dark light pattern so now you understood why we see an alternating dark and light striation it is because of the pattern of the arrangement of the two myoproteins that you can see over here which is nothing but actin and myosin is it clear to all of you so we saw that the actin wherever in the sarcomere i hope you know the area between one z line and the next z line is the sarcomere so wherever in the sarcomere let me continue this dotted line here wherever you find both actin and myosin that zone will be the dark zone where you find only actin and there is no myosin over here see where i am putting tick marks that is referred to as the light zone okay so and one more important thing you need to know is now in the sarcomere certain head like structures project out from the myosin see i am showing here these heads which are projecting out of the myosin are mostly found at the peripheral region of the myosin okay and why why these heads are projecting out we will see in a little while you will understand 
why exactly these head like structures are found projecting out of the myosin and did you notice in the central region of the dark band this is the dark band in the central zone of the dark band it it is slightly less dark why is it slightly less dark because can you see that the actin ends over here the actin does not extend to the center so the central zone has only myosin this is referred to as the h zone the h zone is the central zone of the dark band where what is present only myosin is present and of course there is a protein which holds all the myosin together in place and this protein which holds it appears here as if the myosin is floating in the air but there is a protein that constitutes what is referred to as the m line and this m line is something which holds all the myosin filaments in position okay so this is the structure of the sarcomia this is how actually actin looks like in the diagram of the sarcomia if this is the z line and if this is another z line we showed actin as only lines isn't it and we showed myosin as very very thick proteins which are sitting in the center if you magnify this actin filament this is how the actin filament will look like and i told you that on the myosin if i show you the myosin filament i told you certain heads are projecting out of the myosin filament now if you pull out this head this is how the structure will look like actually it is not just the head it has a tail also isn't it so the actin has a helical structure which is referred which is made up of each individual this entire beaded chain this whole beaded chain is referred to as f actin if you were to label one such bead over this one such beaded structure it is referred to as g actin or globular actin but the entire chain see there are two chains this is one chain and this is a second chain two beaded chains are called f actin and each bead on the chain if you have two pearl necklaces each pearl on the necklace will be the g actin the entire pearl necklace will be f actin okay so each globular unit is called the g actin and the entire chain is referred to as the f actin and then we have another double stranded protein called tropomyosin and then we have another structure called troponin now this troponin is what binds to calcium ion and calcium ion is very very important for muscle to undergo contraction otherwise muscle contraction will not happen normally is that clear so this is how actin looks like and i told you from the myosin heads are projecting out see these are the myosin heads they have a cross arm and then they have a tail isn't it the tail is called light myosin. the cross arm and the head together is referred to as the heavy myosin. and now i had also told you one more thing again let me show you the sarcomere here this is one z line this is the next z line these are the actin filaments which are projecting towards the center now you know how actin looks like and then i took a myosin filament here a thick protein filament which is nothing but the myosin filament and i told you that these heads are projecting out from the corners not the corners towards the periphery see now why these heads are projecting out is because these heads want to bond with the actin filament so the heads above will bond with the actin filament above the heads below will bond with the actin filaments below now why should they bond with the actin filament is because they want to form they want to help in muscle contraction so for your muscle to contract always please remember these globular head these head like structures of these individual heads which are projecting out of the myosin will have to attach to the actin filament on the corresponding side and now you can imagine what will happen now see all the heads are facing upwards correct the moment the head attaches to the actin the head will rotate towards the inside see the head is rotating here so when the head rotates the actin filament also will get pulled towards the center all the heads on the right side will rotate towards the left side all the heads towards the left side will rotate towards the right side so initially the heads are facing like this the heads are facing upwards like this okay they are not bound to actin but once they bind to actin filament like this when what heads are facing upwards like this they will start rotating see these heads will rotate towards this side that is towards their uh, right side and the heads on the right side will rotate towards their left side when they are rotating who are they dragging they are dragging the actin filaments 
closer together now imagine when the actin filaments are dragged the two z lines will also come closer together what will happen to that sarcomere the sarcomere will shorten and this shortening of the sarcomere if it happens in all the sarcomeres of the muscle you can imagine what will happen to your muscle your muscle also will shorten and that shortening of the muscle itself is referred to as muscle contraction so why these heads are projecting out the heads want to attach to actin not only attach after attaching like i've shown here they want to rotate they will rotate inwards to the sarcomere when they attach and rotate they will drag the actin towards the center and when they drag the actin towards the center the z line will also get pushed towards the center from both sides and as a result the length of the sarcomere will decrease okay so that is what is happening over here the biochemical events involved in muscle contraction see the myosin head projecting out it wants to bond with the actin for the head to be able to form a bond with the actin now that bond is referred to as a cross bridge okay for that to happen the head must be in a highly energized state when the head is in a highly energized state it is bound to adp and pi now see here the head has established a contact with actin filament now this always remember let me draw it a little bigger for you here so these are the actin filaments and this is the myosin filament now this is the myosin head it has attached to the actin filament and notice how the head is facing upwards now now this bond that is formed between the actin and the myosin is referred to as the cross bridge this whole thing is a cross bridge okay so cross bridge for the cross bridge to form what should happen it should be attached to adp and pi so now successfully in the second step a cross bridge has been has been formed now notice that there is a rotation that means the head is rotating towards the inside see it was facing upwards now it has it is turning so there is a rotation happening now when it rotates what is it pulling along with it it is pulling the actin filament along with it for the head to rotate what should happen the adp and pi should come off i told you for the head to form a cross bridge adp and pi should be there but now for the head to rotate adp and pi should come off and then what should happen now once the head has rotated and the actin has been pulled to the center the cross bridge has to break and for the cross bridge to break what should come and bind to the head atp should come and bind to the head only if the cross bridge breaks the head will detach the head will detach from the actin and the actin will go back to its original position that means your muscle is relaxing so therefore you can see here atp has come and bound to the head and the head has become detached from the actin filament so this as if it appears as if the myosin and the actin filaments are sliding past each other that's why this theory is the most widely accepted theory of muscle contraction it is called the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction Cori cycle is something that happens in the case of muscles uh, in case of muscle cells all of you should remember one thing that when you are involved in excessive or uh, prolonged exercise say for example you've gone on a marathon walk or you've gone on a uh, uh, on a marathon run or something your muscles will convert pyruvic acid because your muscles are not getting enough oxygen so remember there is low level of oxygen in your muscle as in you're exercising so much that your heart and your lungs are not able to keep pace and so your muscles are not getting enough oxygen so temporarily what happens in your muscle is the muscle will switch to anaerobic respiration and what does it accumulate now it will accumulate a by product that is called by uh, lactic acid and this is associated with muscle cramp when your muscle has lot of lactic acid now say for example the whole day you have done a lot of exercise or you've walked you've gone on a marathon you've gone on a trek or something at the end of the day you can experience severe pain in the uh, in your leg isn't it this is called as a cramp now that cramp is because what has accumulated in your muscles lactic acid has accumulated in the muscle through the cori cycle the lactic acid is sent into the blood so from now after you take rest your pain is gone so what happens during that rest the muscle lactic acid will be sent into the blood the blood will carry the lactic acid here to your liver 
in the liver most of the lactic acid about one fifth of the lactic acid is broken down to give rise to carbon dioxide and water four fifth of the lactic acid is converted to glycogen and it is stored in the liver again and whenever you need this glycogen in the liver will get broken down into glucose it will be sent to your blood and your muscle needs glucose because uh, your muscle needs this energy because for your muscle contraction you need lot of atp so Core cycle is how your muscle get rid of the uh, gets rid of that um, lactic acid, isn't it? So muscle is uh, imagine you are suffering from cramp, you are having severe pain in the leg. That's because you have uh, excessive muscle lactic acid, and that is sent into the blood. The blood takes it to the liver. In the liver, one fourth, one fifth of it is degraded into carbon dioxide and water. The remaining four fifth of it is synthesized glucose, sorry, glycogen in the liver. The glycogen is acting as a store reserve food material whenever your liver need your muscle needs it the glycogen will be broken down into blood glucose it will be sent back to your muscle where your muscle can immediately use up this glucose or it can store it for future use in the form of glycogen okay red and white muscles we have a very thin muscles in our body which are called red muscles which contract very very slowly that's why red muscles are also called the slow twitch muscles whereas the white muscles are also called the fast twitch muscles these muscles which contract very very slowly and they appear a lot of red in colored because they have a red colored pigment in them that is called as myoglobin but these white muscles have less amount of myoglobin that's why they appear white in color since these muscles are slow they are very very slow they are mostly used to you know, to carry out certain functions like for example maintenance of bad body balance and posture but white muscles are very very quick and therefore they can develop a, way, a lot of tension in them so if you suddenly lift something heavy uh, then you're mostly employing your you're mostly recruiting your white muscles and not your red muscles because red muscles are those which contract very slowly obviously you cannot use your red muscles to lift something very heavy so say for example you're standing you, you you might think that when you're standing all your muscles are at rest but your back muscles are constraint constantly contracting to help you maintain your body balance and posture and those muscles which are acting very slowly and they are contracting at a very low rate and they don't accumulate lactic acid in them they are richly supplied with blood which is why they're red in color they have lot of myoglobin they are thin in diameter they are called red muscles whereas the other ones now for example imagine you've gone to the gym it's your first day at the gym and you lift something extremely heavy you suffer from severe fatigue your muscles will suffer from severe fatigue after that and you can experience that pain for several days after that so basically this is because your white muscles your white muscles can lift something very heavy but very quickly these white muscles get tired they get fatigued very quickly because they store a lot of what in them they store a lot of lactic acid in them which is a byproduct of what i showed you in the previous slide what do we uh, get lactic acid from we get lactic acid from anaerobic respiration okay so the brief idea is red muscles are those which uh, contract and relax very very slowly white muscles are those which contract and relax very fast red muscles are slow white muscles are fast red muscles usually do not accumulate lactic acid white muscles accumulate lactic acid red muscles appear red in color because they have lot of blood supply and lot of myoglobin but white muscles are poor in blood supply and poor in myoglobin as a result they are white in coloration and one more thing red muscles have less endoplasmic reticulum in them called sarcoplasmic reticulum but white muscles have more sarcoplasmic reticulum that's why they are able to store a lot of calcium and this calcium will allow them to contract very very quickly and to create a lot of force and that's why they have enormous amounts of extensive network of sarcoplasmic reticulum which store calcium and i told you that red muscles don't get tired very easily they can easily uh, use enough blood and enough mitochondria they have lot of mitochondria in them and you know that if they have lot of mitochondria and if they're getting lot of blood and lot of oxygen they will carry out aerobic respiration there's no uh, need to carry out anaerobic respiration and uh, lactic acid fermentation and if they do not carry out anaerobic fermentation or lactic acid fermentation then there is no question of them uh, accumulating lactic acid okay 
so now moving on to the skeletal system the skeletal system or your skeleton is composed of uh, we have both exoskeleton and endoskeleton but in this chapter we are mostly concerned about the endoskeleton now you know that there are two types of endoskeleton we have axial skeleton along the midline of the body so whatever skeletal parts you have along the midline of the body including your shoulder your your hip and your uh, skull and your vertebral column and your ribs okay not your shoulder i'm sorry your skull your ribs your sternum and your vertebral column is referred to as axial skeleton and something which are present on the sides of your body like your hip bones and your shoulder bones that is your lower limb girdle your upper limb girdle or your shoulder girdle and you have to remember about your bones of your upper limb and the bones of the lower limb all these are referred to as axial uh, appendicular skeleton so those which are present along the central axis are called axial skeleton and those which are present on the lateral sides of the body are referred to as appendicular skeleton so i was just telling you the two way of classifying them is axial skeleton and appendicular skeleton in axial skeleton we have the skull the vertebral column and the thoracic cage with the rib and the uh, the breast bone or the sternum and then in the appendicular you have the limb and the limb girdle your shoulder and the hip region is the limb girdle now you know about the first part of your axial skeleton that is the skull this is the lateral side of the skull you have cranial bones in your skull and facial bones cranial bones like you have one frontal two parietal uh, two temporal one on either sides one occipital at the base of your skull bearing two projections called occipital condyles through which your first vertebral column articulates that's why human skull is called bicondylar skull then you have a lower jaw this is the only movable bone of your uh, skull and it's a facial bone at the base of your tongue you have hyoid which is also included under the uh, under the skull bone and then you have a pair of maxilla which makes up your upper jaw you have a pair of cheekbones that is zygomatic a pair of bones on the nasal bridge called the nasal bone inner side of your eye that is your orbit you have the lacrimal bore be uh, bone bearing your lacrimal sac or the tear sac inner to that you have a single bone that is referred to as the ethmoid bone and there is a single bone at the base of your cranium so this part of your uh, skull is referred to as the cranium because this is where is your brain situated you know that the cranium is referred to as the brain box so in the floor of the cranium you have a butterfly shaped bone you can see how it's butterfly shaped wing you can see one wing on this side one wing on the other side there's only one sphenoid bone so you have to learn the classification of the cranial bones and facial bones like i said cranial bones invest the cranium or the bony compartment inside which the brain is situated and all these are the facial bones which which are forming attachment to your facial muscles okay there are some of the bones which you cannot see facial bones like warmer is not visible because it's found inside your nose inside your uh, nasal chamber which is not shown in this picture you can also see the turbinal bones a pair of turbinal bones inside your nasal chamber you can also see a pair of palatines the palatines are present at the roof of your mouth which you cannot see here so they are also the facial bones okay so two types of skull bones are referred to as the cranial bones and the facial bones there are totally 8 cranial bones and there are totally 14 facial bones like we saw together the skull bones including and also we have to include when we talk about the skull you have to include the bones which you find in your inner ear in your middle ear that is malleus incus and stapes and you have to include what you have to include the hyoid bone so it is 22 plus 6 because there are three bones on this side of your middle ear and three bones on the other sides of uh, on the other side so it is 28 plus one hyoid bone that is totally 29 bones in your skull okay then moving on to the vertebral column the vertebral column has a set of about 33 bones you can see how they are ring like bones which are arranged one upon the other in a serial pattern the cervical bones are the bones which are present in your neck we have a total of 7 cervical vertebra we have a total of 12 thoracic vertebra we have 5 lumbar vertebra five of the vertebra are fused together to form the sacrum and about 3 to 4 vertebrae fused together to form the tailbone which is referred to as the sacrum what is this side of your body the back side of your body called it is called the dorsal and this is the side of the body in which you find your vertebral column your belly side is nothing but the ventral side 
okay then you have the rib cage please remember the first seven pairs are referred to as the true ribs the eight nine and ten are called as the false ribs because the eight nine and ten they do not have their own cartilage they join you can see how the eight nine and ten cartilages join the cartilage of the seventh rib this is the cartilage of the seventh rib the eighth ninth and the tenth rib the cartilage joins the cartilage of the seventh rib and then articulate with this bone in the center this is the sternum bone always remember the rib cage articulates with the sternum in the front and there are two bones there are two ribs which are floating below the eleventh and the twelfth pair they don't even come all the way to the sternum as a result they are referred to as the floating ribs they are meant for protection of your kidney then the bones of the pelvic pectoral girdle see the pectoral girdle has a collar bone that is called as the clavicle isn't it and then this triangular bone at the back is referred to as the scapula the clavicle and the scapula make up your shoulder your shoulder girdle okay we are seeing one half of your pectoral girdle here and then you have the humerus which is the bone of your upper arm and then you have the bone of your forearms that is lateral remember the part the side which is away from your center away from the middle of your body or the midline of your body is the lateral and this is the medial because this is closer to the midline of your body so the lateral bone of the forearm is nothing but the radius and the medial bone is the ulna and then you have the bones of your wrist which are called carpals the bones of your palm called metacarpals and the bones of your fingers called phalanges now we are seeing one half of your pelvic girdle this bone is referred to as the coxal bone it is formed by the fusion of a broad is ilium and an anterior pubis and a posterior ischium all of you remember uh, this ilium also has a socket over here into which fits the head of femur the femur is the largest bone the longest bone it is basically the thigh bone and then you have the knee bone the kneecap which is called as the patella and then in your shin region or your shank region again away from the midline of your body is called the lateral side towards the midline of the body is called the medial side away from the midline of the body you have the fibula over here and the tibia is the one that faces or it is towards the medial side of your leg and then the bones of your ankle are called tarsals the bones of the feet are called as the metatarsals and the bones of the digits of your feet that are that are your toes are referred to as phalanges types of joints fibrous joints fibrous joints are those joints that are mediated by fibrous connective tissue the bones between and they are immovable joints completely there are some of them are actually slightly movable but largely these uh, fibrous joints are immovable like for example you have the bones between the joints between the bones of your skull which is called the suture and the inferior uh, the tibiofibular joint which is basically a fibrous joint it is slightly movable fibrous joint and then the joint between the teeth and your socket of your teeth is referred to as comphosis it is nothing but a fibrous joint then you have cartilaginous joint at the end of your long bones you have a region which is where the bone is actively growing and that region is called as the epiphyseal plate it is a temporary hyaline cartilage joint as the bone along gates it becomes thinner and thinner and this is your coxal bone you can see the anterior bone which is the pubis where the pubis meets anteriorly there is a pad of fibrous cartilage that you can see here and this pad of fibrous cartilage is what makes up something called as the pubic symphysis which is a type of cartilage in its joint because i told you this is not a connective uh, i mean it is cartilage is a connective tissue but it is a specialized connective tissue which is referred to as the a uh, fibrous cartilage the same type of fibrous cartilage is found between the bones of your backbone also and uh, they are referred to as the symphysis in this case it is referred to as the symphysis okay so between the vertebrae you have the intervertebral disc which is made up of fibrous cartilage here between the two pubic regions you have the uh, fibrous cartilage again remember i'm talking about cartilage over here which is referred to as the pubic symphysis so many types of synovial joints in the neck region between the atlas and axis you have the pivot joint in your elbow region you have the hinge joint hinge joint can move only in one plane and then you have the wrist joint that is between your carpal and the radius the radius is the lateral bone of your forearm
it is referred to as the condyloid joint it is an incomplete ball and socket joint and then you have the ball and socket joint which is located the largest ball and socket joint is in your hip joint between the head of the femur and the acetabulum which is a cup shaped depression of course your shoulder joint is also a ball and socket joint between the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity of the scapulum and uh, scapula and then you have between your thumb that is the metacarpal of your thumb and one of the carpal bones called trapezium you have a bone uh, a joint that's why your thumb can move so freely compared to the other fingers it is called the saddle joint and then you have the joints between your tarsals that is your ankle bones and the joints between your wrist bones that is whenever you rotate your wrist for example or you rotate your ankle the bones glide past each other this is called the gliding joint or the planar joint disorders we need to discuss about some of the disorders like myasthenia gravis where there is communication that is disrupted in the neuromuscular junction now this is because there is uh, it is a type of autoimmunity that is your own body produces antibodies against specialized neurotransmitter receptors called acetylcholine receptors so a person's own immune system is destroying his own receptors in his body so it is referred to as an autoimmune disorder like myasthenia gravis and then you have muscular dystrophy due to the absence of a very important protein that is called dystrophin which helps in maintaining the structure and function of your muscle if this protein itself is missing then the person suffers from duquesne muscular dystrophy then moving on to osteoporosis osteoporosis is seen in women who are in their menopausal stage because their estrogen level starts coming down and as a result of which you can see that the bones lose their density the bones become brittle and they become very thin and they're easily uh, fracturable and therefore you can say this condition is called osteoporosis arthritis is the swelling of the joints there is accumulation of joint fluid swelling there is inability and pain during movement isn't it in that we have to learn about osteoarthritis in which at all the end of your long bones you have a a uh, um, layer of cartilage that is present here the cartilaginous layer is damaged and tendons and ligaments become stretched causing pain okay so tendons and ligaments become stretched and they cause pain and bones may rub against each other that's what causes severe pain in case of arthritis rheumatoid arthritis is again an autoimmune disease where your immune system itself produce antibodies which destroys the synovial membrane that is present in your joints infectious arthritis it could be due to infection of any pathogenic agent gout is where there is accumulation of uric acid crystals in the joint sometimes what happens is the joints have uh, due to the diet of the person or due to the uh, era, uh, impaired uric acid metabolism so what happens is uric acid starts getting crystallized in the joints and therefore it usually makes the joints in move immobile or severe pain associated with movement of the joints which is referred to as gout tetany is where the muscles are rapidly contracting and relaxing even without your control there is a sudden wave of contraction and relaxation that relaxation that is seen and this is because it is again due to very little calcium in the blood suppose a person has very little calcium in the blood it is seen that calcium controls the excitation of neurons now if the person has very little calcium in his blood his neurons will become very very excited and therefore the nerves will start firing so much and hence the muscles will have to suffer i mean uh, this muscle undergoes a lot of contraction and relaxation and that is due to the imbalance of calcium now moving on to the next chapter that is the neural control and coordination in this chapter we will be learning about the meanings of control and coordination there is a necessary crosstalk that is required among different organs of your body and this necessary communication or crosstalk is mediated by the nervous system for example you are exercising your muscles are contracting and contracting and contracting how does your heart know that it needs to pump more blood how does your lung know that it needs to breathe more that is because nerves are picking up signals from your muscles and And the nerves are delivering these signals to your muscles and as a result it's the nerves that help in communication of more than two organs and this is what is the role of nerves it coordinates and it integrates different organ systems in the body so coordination like i said different organ system interact and complement with each other so that a particular perform a function can be performed in a synchronized manner human neural system consists of a central nervous system which is made up of the brain and the spinal cord and a peripheral nervous system all of you know that the peripheral nervous system consists of nerves which can either come out of the brain they are called cranial nerves or spinal nerves if they come out of the spinal cord then you also have have to remember 
that there are nerves which carry signals towards your CNS from the stim from the receptors. If the nerves are uh, emerging from receptors and carry signals towards your central nervous system, then they are called afferent or sensory fibers. If the nerves are carrying signal towards the target organ from the brain and spinal cord, they are called efferent or motor neurons, motor nerves. Then we also can classify PNS into two major. So now we classified the nerves, afferent and efferent nerves, which are a part of peripheral nervous system. But the two major divisions of the peripheral nervous system is somatic neural system and autom or autonomic neural system. Basically, it depends upon where the nerve is carrying the signal. In somatic nervous system, the signal is carried on to somatic components like, for example, your skeletal muscle. From the brain or from your sp spinal cord, the nerve is carrying the signal. The nerve is carrying the impulses towards your skeletal muscle then it makes up the somatic neural system what if it carries the signal what if there is a nerve or a neuron which is carrying signal from your central nervous system like your brain and spinal cord to involuntary organs which are not under your control like smooth muscles you can also include glands over here you cannot control the glands in your body so what if the ner nerves or neurons are carrying the signal to your um, uh, to involuntary parts of your body then we call them as autonomic nervous system there are two types the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system you all have learnt about the structure of multipolar neuron there is a cyton with a nucleus and there are nissle bodies or nissle granules which are regions which have which are very very rich in protein synthesis and there is uh, they have lot of ribosomes in them. So we have learnt about nissel granules and the nissel granules extend in the dendrites as well And then you have the cell body the nucleus and you have the main part of the neuron which conducts impulses That is called as the axon You can see how the axon is wrapped with Schwann cells and the Schwann cell wrap around the axon to form a lipid rich layer That is referred to as the myelin sheath and wherever you don't see the myelin sheath that particular region is referred to as the node of ran where the space where myelin sheath is missing at the end how the axon branches into the finest of branches called axon terminals which end in bulb like structures and these bulb like structures release what are referred to as the neurotransmitters which help in signaling to the next neuron okay so now generation of nerve impulse or action potential this happens inside axon all of you please remember whenever your axon is excited whenever it is carrying nerve impulse notice how the inside of your axon has become positively charged the outside of the axon has become negatively charged and this kind of a change in the membrane where the inside becomes positive and the outside becomes negative is referred to as the depolarization so what is it referred to as it is called depolarization so please remember the inside becoming positive and the outside becoming negative of the membrane of your axon that means your axon is in an excited condition and now if you measure the potential difference between the inside and the outside it will measure plus 30 millivolt and this potential difference is what is referred to as the nerve impulse or axon potential did you notice in the neighboring region which is still in a resting state let me call this as resting state okay because they have not received the nerve impulse still so we call this resting state see notice there is inside is negative and outside is positive so this condition where inside is negative and outside is positive in the neighboring region is referred to as the polarized condition this is in resting state it is depolarized when it is excited it is polarized when it is uh, in a resting state and why did it become depolarized notice what is flowing in sodium ions are flowing in when sodium ions gush into your axon the inside of the axon becomes positive the outside becomes negative and it attains a state called depolarization when you attain a state of depolarization the voltage across the membrane is plus 30 millivolt this is the new voltage that develops across the membrane when your axon is excited this new voltage is referred to as the action potential or it is also referred to as in common terms we call it as the mostly we refer to it as nerve impulse now what is the voltage when it is in resting state if you were to measure the voltage across the membrane when inside is negative outside is positive the voltage will be minus 70 millivolt and this voltage is referred to as the resting membrane potential okay the voltage during excitation is called action potential the voltage that you see when you're uh, 
axon has become excited it is referred to as the resting membrane uh, sorry when your axon is in resting state the voltage of minus 70 is called resting membrane potential when your axon is in excited state the voltage is referred to as um, action potential or the nerve impulse and see how it is spreading the excitation is spreading see how they have shown arrows over here in the second diagram i want you to see arrows are showing that the action potential or the depolarization is spreading from one region to another now when it spreads when the charges move again here also the inside becomes positive and the outside becomes negative so now this region of the axon that is the b region will also develop a voltage of plus 30 millivolt and it will also become or it will generate a nerve impulse now notice how the neighboring region has negative inside again these charges will start flowing to the neighboring say the neighboring region is c which is currently in a resting state now these charges will start moving again in the neighboring region the inside will become plus and the outside will become minus that means it is excited that means it is depolarized and here also a new voltage will be developed that is of plus 30 millivolt so you can imagine the charges keep moving from one place to another and that is how the nerve impulse reaches the end of the axon and we had seen in the end of the axon there are finer branches the branches are referred to as the axon terminals which end in bulb like structures which are referred to as the synaptic knob or the synaptic bulb and when the action potential or the nerve impulse reaches the synaptic knob certain chemical substances are released from the synaptic knob which are referred to as the neurotransmitter somewhere close by there is another neuron the dendrite of another neuron sitting over here and this dendrite of another neuron will Will pick up these neurotransmitters and they will excite the next neuron and i hope you know this junction through which the signal is passed from one neuron to another is referred to as the synapse the physiological junction or the space between the axonal terminal or the synaptic knob of one neuron and the dendritic surface of another neuron is referred to as the synapse See, this is what is the synapse i was telling you about this is the synaptic knob of one neuron this is the dendritic surface so it's like this if this is the synaptic knob of one then this will be the dendrite of another neuron so this is the cyton of another neuron and again axon will continue so nucleus is here okay this is the axon of the next neuron this is the synaptic bulb of the neuron 1 and this space between the dendrite of neuron 2 let me call this as neuron 2 the cytoplasm is there cellate shaped cell body or uh, pericarion is there okay so this space this junction is referred to as the synapse which has been shown over here you can see how the action potential is coming down that is the nerve impulse is reaching down and how all these sac like structures called synaptic vesicles which contain in them the neurotransmitters they are fusing with the cell membrane and they're releasing their neurotransmitters to the uh, synaptic cleft the gap between the two membrane is called the synaptic cleft the membrane of the synaptic terminal is called the presynaptic membrane the membrane of the dendrite of neuron see this is neuron 1 this is neuron 2 the membrane of the neuron 2 is called postsynaptic membrane all of these together constitutes the synapse and then can you see that the postsynaptic membrane has ion channels which is shown here these ion channels will bind to these neurotransmitters and they will let in ions and when they let in ions this neuron 2 will also develop positive charges inside and negative charges outside and that means this neuron 2 also has become excited so there are chemical what we just saw now is a chemical synapse because the release of uh, uh, there is a fluid filled gap between the two membranes which we had learnt as the synaptic cleft and in the synaptic cleft we had seen that there is nothing but the release of neurotransmitters now in the central nervous system all of you should learn the structure of the brain thoroughly this is just an overview there are three parts in the brain you can see the forebrain you can see the midbrain over here it is not labeled over here this portion is the midbrain okay which made up which is made up of the optic lobes or the corpora quadrigemina the forebrain has a lower blue portion that you can see is the thalamus and the hypothalamus and the major part which is the brown portion is referred to as the cerebrum the brain stem is the midbrain 
brain and the hind brain actually it is not the mid brain and the hind brain in the latest edition of the textbook they have modified it the mid brain and the pons and the medulla is the brain stem okay so it is not the mid brain and the hind brain so go through the latest edition of the textbook to get the meaning of the uh, brain stem mid brain as it is shown here it is slightly below this point i told you this is the bump the, these bumpy structures that you see here are the optic lobes hind brain has in the front it has pons it has medulla and it has this structure behind which is referred to as the spinal cord one of the easiest ways to identify midbrain is a canal passes through the midbrain all of you see here this canal is referred to as the cerebral aqueduct so the cerebral aqueduct is passing and the cerebral aqueduct carries a liquid in it which is referred to as the cerebrospinal fluid and notice on the cerebral hemisphere the each half of the cerebrum is called the cerebral hemisphere the cerebral hemispheres are connected together by a band of axons which is referred to as the corpus callosum which is unique to the mammalian brain and in the cerebral hemispheres they have shaded two areas the red area represents the sen the motor area and the blue area represents the sensory area along with that these areas which are not shaded you can call them as association areas association areas help in the communication between these red areas i told you the red areas are the motor areas and the uh blue areas are the sensory areas so the sensory and the motor areas will be will can communicate with the help of the association area association area is also involved in communication and memory and then deep inside the cerebral hemisphere it is not shown here but there will be a structure if you dissect out the cerebral hemisphere if you take sections you can see a structure inside which is hidden inside the cerebral hemisphere which is called as the limbic lobe or the limbic system very very important important the limbic lobe or the limbic system consists of parts which are referred to as the amygdala as well as there's one more thing which is called as the hippocampus so hippocampus and amygdala together constitute what is referred to as the limbic lobe which is hidden deep inside the cerebral hemisphere and these two limbic lobes are mostly involved in emotional responses they help in expressing emotions like pleasure pain and then there is fear and anger etc they also help in motivation behaviors motivational behaviors and most importantly they also take part in the regulate the sexual behavior of an organism okay now reflex action involves only the spinal cord isn't it now in the spinal cord there is a central gray matter like a butterfly wing which is gray matter means it's only made up of cytons and the peripheral white matter is referred to as the uh, it has what axons in it now notice that this is the knee jerk reflex there is a muscle on the upper part of your thigh there is a muscle on the lower part of your thigh the muscles which is present on the upper part of your thigh is referred to as the extensor muscle and the muscle that is present on the lower part of your thigh is referred to as the flexor muscle okay now see the extensor muscle the extensor muscle has a tendon which passes over your knee cap or the patella and attaches to the tibia the bone of your shank okay now when the doctor taps a gently on this tendon see that he is gently tapping on this tendon immediately your leg will move forward now why that happens is when this tendon is tapped there will be a sensory structure in the extensor muscle called the muscle spindle which will capture this uh, tap or this disturbance and it will pass the signal through the sensory neuron see the blue neuron is the sensory neuron how do we know it is sensory it is carrying the signal towards the spinal cord it reaches the spinal cord towards the dorsal region and then it branches into two and notice it is sending its signal to this let us first focus on the orange neuron it excites the orange neuron the orange neuron will deliver these electrical signals away from the spinal cord that's why it is called motor neuron but it terminates on the same muscle from where the signal originated and this muscle will now undergo contraction you can imagine if it undergoes contraction the pull will be exerted down the tendon and the pull will be exerted on the tibia and therefore your leg will move forward for this to happen the lower muscle that is flexor must be in inhibited condition that's why the sensory neuron gives out a second branch which activates an interneuron which blocks the activity of this pink motor neuron so that this pink motor neuron does not carry any signals to this 
flexor muscle so the flexor muscle is not receiving any signal and therefore the flexor muscle is in a sleeping in a resting state so only the extensor muscle is active and when the extensor muscle notice from where the signal arose there only the signal terminates so this muscle is both the receptor as well as the target or the target organ or the effector for this reflex action okay which is the muscle which is the neuron which is taking the signal towards the spinal cord the blue neuron which is the neuron which is sending the signal to the muscle from where the signal arose the orange neuron which is the neuron which is sleeping the pink neuron because the interneuron which is an inhibitory interneuron is activated by the sensory neuron the blue neuron which puts this pink colored motor neuron to sleep and so that the extensor muscle does not receive any signals and sorry the flexor muscle does not receive any signals that means the flexor muscle is in an inhibited condition okay so one of these muscles should be inhibited for you to move your leg outside see the response leg is moving outside for you to move your leg or for your leg to get stretched ahead then the flexor muscle should be in the inhibited state the extensor muscle should be in its excited state that means it should undergo contraction the flexor muscle should not undergo contraction now the parts of the eye you know the parts of the eye the outermost clear part is referred to as the white part is the sclera the richly supplied black blue uh, colored part is called as the choroid the inner part is the retina the retina is the photosensitive layer the region where only cones are present is called the fovea the region where there is absolutely no photoreceptor cells is the blind spot because all the axons are exiting your eye through the optic nerve which are a bundle of axons which are going to go to the visual area of your brain the space between the lens and your uh, retina is called the vitreous chamber filled with vitreous humor in front of the lens you have the aqueous chamber filled with the aqueous humor above and below the lens you have the ciliary muscle which is nothing but a continuation of the choroid layer and then you have an extension of the ciliary muscle which is referred to as the iris which basically ensures that it guards the uh, pupil the pupil is the space through which light passes in front of the lens into the lens and then you have the sclera which is bulged in the front front into a transparent region which is referred to as the cornea in mechanism of vision in the retina you have certain special photoreceptor cells for example they have you have rods these cells have rod like outer segments okay and they have a cell a cell like structure a cell body you can call it and they have synaptic terminals now these rod like structures have disc like like how in chloroplast you had membranous disc like structures called thylakoids these rods also have now why is it called as a rod because the outer segment is rod like and it is very very sensitive to dim light somewhere here the nucleus will be there now if you were to magnify this particular membranous disc like structure on the membranous disc like structure you will find a complex you will find a protein complex which is referred to as rhodopsin okay now this particular rhodopsin will contain a protein and a very important vitamin derivative the protein part of rhodopsin is referred to as opsin and the vitamin derivative is referred to as levensis retinal it's a vitamin uh, it's a vitamin derivative okay vitamin a derivative levensis retinal and opsin so this is this together the vitamin along with the opsin together is referred to as the rhodopsin i hope you know the rhodopsin is sensitive to dim vision it is also called uh, what is it called it is meant for scotopic vision dim vision means scotopic vision dark uh, bright vision is in cone that is called photopic vision here it is nothing but dim vision that is uh, the scotopic vision okay so this is referred to as the rhodopsin or the visual purple and now you have in this opsin now imagine that light falls onto this opsin this retina this rhodopsin molecule when light falls onto this rhodopsin molecule now see what is going to happen this 
opsin is going to stay as it is but the retinol will change in its structure see i had drawn it as a circle but now i'm showing it as a different structure because it gets isomerized into all trans retinol now when it has changed its structure it can no longer remain attached to the opsin so it detaches from the opsin and when it detaches from the opsin a lot of chemical reactions will progress which will create an electrical disturbance in the rod see electrical disturbance is created and this electrical disturbance will allow the rod to release neurotransmitters which are sent through several cells like in your retina you also have bipolar cells and ganglionic cells which carry the signal to your brain so basically what you need to remember is that in the rod cell in the outer segments you have these rhodopsin molecules which get dissociated levin cis retinol changes into all trans retinol and that gets dissociated into uh, from the opsin and this is called bleaching now when levin cis retinol changes into all trans retinol and when it gets dissociated from opsin it is called bleaching and that sets off a chain reaction in the cytoplasm of the rod and that chain reaction will create an electrical disturbance a change in the membrane potential the charge distribution across the membrane will change and that charge distribution which is a membrane potential will be transmitted all the way down and it will release neurotransmitters from the rods the same thing happens in the case of cone also but in cone it is for brighter vision or photopic vision here we talked about rod which is consisting of rhodopsin which has opsin plus levin cis retinol it is mainly for dim vision or scotopic vision here you know there are three parts there is external ear which has pinna and external auditory canal or meatus and then you have the tympanum or the ear drum and after that you have the middle ear cavity in which you find three bony ossicles that is the malleus the incus the stapes the stapes fits into a small opening called oval window in the inner part of your ear the inner part of your ear has a snail shell like structure called the cochlea and it has the semicircular canals oriented in three different positions and then from the cochlea you can see a nerve that is coming out which is referred to as the cochlear nerve okay this entire inner ear that you see is made up of bone so this brown covering that they have shown here in the inner ear it is actually bony and that is why the inner ear is also referred to as the bony labyrinth it is actually a bony compartment or a bony chamber that's why it is referred to as the bony labyrinth so if you were to see the bony chamber let me just show you an outline line of the bony chamber inside the bony chamber you will have a membranous compartment the same shape of the bone you will find the membranous structure inside the membranous structure is modified into uh, compartments which is called the upper compartment which i'm showing here which is the utriculus and a very small chamber that is called the sacculus and from the sacculus a canal extends through the cochlea this is called the cochlear duct okay and this bony part that is the cochlea is coiled like a snail shell throughout the cochlea you can see a membranous tube that is passing through that membranous tube is nothing but referred to as the cochlear duct so the outer one is made up of bone it is the bony compartment the inner membrane is made up of membrane so it is called the membranous labyrinth okay in between the bony and the membranous compartment there will be a fluid the fluid is referred to as the so somewhere here the oval window will be there fitted onto the oval window is one of the bony structures that is the stapes so the fluid between the bony and the membranous compartment is called the perilymph and inside the membranous compartment i'm showing fluid in the form of circles and this fluid inside the membrane is referred to as the endolymph so please remember it is perilymph on the outside and endolymph on the inside the inside of the membrane has endolymph and the outside of the membrane has perilymph now imagine the snail shell like structure i told you it is made up of a bony wall but inside there is a membranous compartment now how many chambers can you see inside there is an upper chamber which i am numbering as one a middle chamber that is numbered as two the lower chamber that is numbered as three so if you take a cross section of the cochlea if you take a cross section of this particular 
particular bony cochlea you will see a set of three canals or three chambers that are passing through it now can you tell me which is the canal which has bony and membrane is both in it the upper canal has bone uh, upon, bone above and membrane below the middle canal has bone on both sides the lower canal has membrane above bone below so remember there are three canals which are passing through and if you take a section you can see that section like this so i told you the cochlea has three canals the upper canal is referred to as the scala vestibuli the middle canal which is made up of c both upper membrane and lower membrane the upper membrane is called the reasoner's membrane and the lower membrane is called the basilar membrane and the lower compartment in the cochlea so basically this blue structure is nothing but the bone isn't it so bone on top and bone below but this middle compartment is entirely made up of the membrane so what red color i have shown here is the membranous part of the cochlea this membranous canal is referred to as the scala media it is also called the cochlear duct and above and below there are chambers the scala vestibuli and scala tympani <coughs> In the lower angle of the scala media, you can find the structure which is referred to as the organ of corti and this organ of corti is what is involved in picking up the sound signals. When sound comes in and falls on your eardrum and on your stapes, I had told you between the bony and the membranous layer, there is perilymph and here inside there is endolymph. Inside the membrane there is endolymph. Vibrations are created in these membrane and when the vibration disturbs the organ of corti, vibrations disturb the organ of corti, the organ of corti generates electrical signals and see the electrical signals are carried down through the cochlear nerve to your brain okay so this is what is the section of the cochlea so this completes a very very rough overview of two chapters that is locomotion in uh, locomotion and movement and the neural control and coordination thank you